Oh. I was just going to ask real quick, is it Tanny or Taney? Tanny. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right. Good. Here we go. It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. Landon Mance and I, Austin Peterson, the co-hosts of this program, are excited to have Ed Tanny in today from Tanny Engineering, all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada. He's just down the street from Landon. Ed, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to, uh, to having a very good, um, very good discussion. Yeah, we're, we're excited about the discussion. Landon's been uh, talking to me a little bit about uh, your guys' um, meeting and how you first met on the golf course. And, you know, I, I figure you can't be that good of a golfer if you were golfing with Landon. <laughs> <laughs> we both have challenges. We'll just let it go with that. <laughs> well, we're, we're excited to have you on the show today. And we, we typically start, Ed, by having our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally, maybe a, a little bit of history of, of what brought you to where you are today. And building the company. And so if you don't mind, uh, just tell us a little bit about you and your family and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, I'm 57 years old. I'm a graduate of Carson High School up in Northern Nevada in 1981 and really have been in the state of Nevada a majority of my life. I did have a little bit of a stint up in the Midwest, up in North Dakota. And that was um, about like seven years ago or so. Um, I'm an actual graduate from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And I came into the engineering field in the, in the mid 80s. And I would consider myself to be extremely fortunate in a couple of regards in that um, coming out of high school, I was very, very good in mathematics and somewhat challenged, I would say, and maybe some of the finer arts and in the English. And so I uh, kind of blindly chose engineering, kind of blindly chose civil engineering. And I ended up um, in the middle of a, a hotbed in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1985. And that allowed me to really progress rapidly, much like you guys have down in the Phoenix area, um, just phenomenal growth. I mean, unbridled. I don't even know what the correct term would be. But um, it enabled me to come into the consulting realm, which is what uh, Tanning Engineering is all about, where we really cater to private development. And so we, we cater to home builders and we cater to industrial builders, commercial. And we also do some public works oriented type of work. But, um, Coming into Las Vegas in the mid 80s, other than a couple of blips and a couple of slowdowns, it's um, just been phenomenal growth. It allowed me to really hone my skills as a young engineer and ultimately work my way up into, into ownership. And so I formulated uh, Tandy Engineering in the year 2000 with a, a wonderful partner. And we have since brought another partner in. So there's actually three of us that uh, run this operation. And uh, we have just been I would call it blessed, and we've um, gone through some rough times, but have gone through some very, very good times, and things are going very, very well, and I love what I do, and so all of that is just um, quite a bit of fortune. Also, I've integrated uh, an extremely lovely wife. I'm just, I'm blessed in that regard, too, and then we just have a fabulous relationship. We have three kids, um, all currently in the college age. Um, I've got one that's going to go for her master's now, and then two more that are still in their undergrad stage. And we um, are hunkered down here in Las Vegas, and we got kids going to school all over the place. But um, just a, a wonderful existence. So, yeah, that's that's awesome to uh, to hear about, and it also explains why you don't have any hair on the top of your head. <laughs> that's that's, that's the consulting. Time. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's the <laughs> consulting. Okay. <laughs> it had to We're be selling the, the other, kids. Yeah, yeah. They add to the the follicle, the follicle challenge challenges as well. So. <laughs> Well, that's great. No, it's it seems like obviously you've you've built a great firm over the last twenty years. It sounds like, and um, you know, engineering for me, uh, 
it's something close to me just based on the fact that I've got a, I've got a father-in-law that's an aerospace engineer. Um, even though aerospace engineering didn't exist as a program in college when he went, he's, he's 91 years old. So he's been retired for quite some time, but, uh, studied electrical engineering and then aerospace kind of took off in the, in the late sixties, seventies, and into the eighties and nineties. And, Mm -hmm. um, so he had a great career in that. And then I've got a very close personal friend of mine. That's a, a civil engineer, uh, up in, uh, where is it? I guess it's Lehigh, Utah. Okay. Yeah. So he, and he loves it. He, uh, he's actually helped me personally with some real estate development projects that I've, that I've worked on over the years. And it's, uh, it, it, it's a unique field. It's something that I would never be able to get into. I did great in math until geometry and calculus got introduced and I was in trouble. <laughs> you tapped out at that point. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I don't know. Well, that's, um, maybe just really quickly though, uh, that's, that's exactly the type of um, clientele that we, we work with primarily, you know, real estate development. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, for me, I grew up in a construction family. My, my dad was a, was a contractor. Uh, I actually have owned a company in the past uh, outside of my financial planning business that, that did residential and commercial painting. And then I've just kind of always been involved in, in construction and, and development over the years. And I've like a lot of people took a bath when the real estate market uh, collapsed in mm -hmm. 2007, 2008. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a business that I, that I understand just with the way that I grew up. Um, but I also understand where the big risks are now. And, and I made some mistakes and, and moved some dirt. And now I just make decisions that are prior to moving dirt and, and I sell it and let other people take that risk. Uh, you know what, sir, I've already, I've already sensed a great deal of wisdom here. <laughs> I, and I mean that wholeheartedly too. And that is um, so, so profoundly true with what you just had to say. And then, you know, flipping it back over to, to my court is that um, what does, what does lead to um, loss of hair in this profession is it's wonderful to be an engineer. It's wonderful to um, go out and do a grading plan on a piece of property and to lay out the utilities and do the, the stuff that we that we like to do. But where the um, the complications come, it's just the, the business world and it's the, the way that money works. And a lot of builders and developers will, unfortunately, they don't have the ability to go cash out land. And so, yeah. you know, you're getting into a piece of land, whether it be 10 acres, 40 acres or larger, and there's a huge interest carry associated with that. And when they come to a civil engineering firm, it's one thing to do the engineering correctly, which we feel like we can do amply and most of the time, if not all the time, but it's... um trying to deal with governing entities on getting the permits. And that's where the stress and strain comes in. And I'm sure that you've probably um, delved into that, into that realm. So, you know, on the engineering side, we um, have a whole fleet of different personnel that assist with that. But um, ultimately the developers will wanna know where their permits are. When, when can I grade and when can I go vertical and when can I, you know, start my utilities? And um, they hold us responsible for it. So. Your yeah. wisdom and not turning dirt is um is profound and and I and I hear you so <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean there's still issues ahead of that right like you said I mean working with the city is not easy I've had a project that even with a master plan completely approved you find out that the city was not ready for something or they didn't have enough sewer capacity for the land that you're trying to develop and you know they're not sure if they want to rezone it or you know you look at the zoning and they'll say you know four units per acre and then oh well actually maybe we're better with three based on the way that things look and you know just the back and forth and getting plat approval and getting the traffic study and the engineering done it's it's a lot of work but uh, yeah. it is it is something that I enjoy and it's mm -hmm. it's actually not a bad way to make some money uh on the side for me oh amen to that too yeah and I think um through all of that, I, you know, I, I think we all have, um, you know, from my perspective, kind of a divine appointment to do what we do. And a lot of folks that are just not um, as fortunate as I am and that um, I was meant to do this. And I don't know, uh, my wife, she basically accuses me of a little bit of sadism and masochism because I enjoy this. And she, <laughs> she's just shaking her head on occasion. But I'll tell you what, though, is that when you, um, when you get into any realm in life, though, 
is that you do get older and you get wiser and you get more knowledge. And I tell you what, I have learned just an, an incredible amount and I continue to learn and I've really progressed with um, a lot of things that make me a much better consultant and a much better owner, a much better employer. Um, and it just continues to grow inside of me. And it's um, something we always got to look at that you know, from that perspective is that Although there's going to be stresses and strains, whether it's a land in and, you know, some young kids right now, and the Lord knows there's a lot of strain with that. And then when you're in the business realm, having clients um, being a little bit anxious about getting their permits, there's always a proper way to handle that. And um, I tell you what, we can all get a lot better and I continue to grow at it. So I just, um, I'm enjoying life more than ever now, even in the middle of this COVID crisis, because of that is the challenges that have been thrown at my feet and and then um, just trying to deal with them. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Austin, let me, yeah, go ahead. sorry. I just want to jump in because I, I want to stay on that train there if we can, Ed. Um, you know, you mentioned challenges and working through, you know, through them um, and, and coming out, you know, stronger on the other side. So talk to us a little bit about that. You know, what, what are some of the things that you have been faced with recently and, 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 you know, what have you done to, you know, adapt to those and, and you make your company and your management team and yourself, you know, stronger as a leader. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and great point. So recently, um, th this is kind of crazy on how um, almost sovereign that the, um, the civil engineering industry has been through this. And that right off the bat, a lot of companies have closed and closed down very abruptly. Um, I know a lot of friends, personal friends of mine that have lost daycares, for instance, and restaurants. And it's awful, it really is. It's been um, beyond a challenge. I don't even know what I would do if I were in that predicament, but in the civil engineering side, I'm right off the bat, they considered construction to be vital. And thank God you know, for that. I've, um, we, we definitely have had challenges with that and I'll get to that in a second. But for the most part, um, we put on 10 people here. We've actually grown and um, I'm not going to say that our profits are going through the roof, but they've been the, they've maintained fairly stable at it. The real challenges with what has happened with the COVID crisis really comes to the, um, I, to me, it's the fright that's going on. And Lord knows that this is a real virus. And I don't want to downplay that one iota. I personally went through it. I, I had it about a month and a half ago and had a couple of days where I was um, sweating quite a bit. And, you know, it was challenging, but nonetheless, I came out okay on the back end of that, but um, what's really um, prominent in, in all fields is um, people are extremely frightened of being in an atmosphere and like in, a, in this enclosed um, 10,000 square foot building that we have. We have the right policies in place. We wear masks whenever we have public come in, we certainly do and we um, social distance. We're very careful about that. But a lot of employees are just scared to the point where they wanna work remotely. And you have to honor that, you really do um, because me personally, I'm not that full of fear and for a completely different reason. I, um, I just don't have that fear when it comes to that type of anxiety with the virus, but other people certainly do and it's very real in them. So now when you um, end up having to allow that to happen, you know, you could have half of your staff out working remotely and the challenges that accompany that then is you can almost watch it is that, um, you know, really the, the profits kind of taper down because people are not here. And in the consulting realm, it's, it's vitally important to me anyway, to communicate, to walk down in a couple of offices and have a dialogue with people. And from a team structure on what we do in producing plans, that same, uh, that same sort of thing is just vitally important. So that's been a challenge, but yet um, we've absolutely overcome it. And um, in regard to using more of the Teams um, type of software and the go-to meetings and I think we've actually found a very, very happy medium where we can support people and yet um, we keep the productivity um, at a very, very reasonable level. And um, I don't know what the future is gonna hold though. <laughs> you know, let's kind of keep our fingers crossed as we, as we move forward. Now, it's just unbelievable to me is that we've got a staff size now of 60, which is maxed out on a 10,000 square foot building. And, we're to a point now where we got so many opportunities we're actually having to contemplate turning down some work. So um, just fortunate, you know, and I, um, I attribute a lot to that and mostly just um, we're just fortunate. So things have been very, very good. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So um, 
let's talk a little bit about uh, you know the Southern Nevada marketplace as it pertains to what what you guys do. Um, you know, you kind of have alluded to the fact um, in uh, you know prior conversation, or I should say in your in your intake form that there's really been this big shift. And I, I, I'm curious, well, let me mention what, what you said. So the shift is really from this large, you know, scale uh, industrial, um, I'm sorry, more, more from retail to more large scale industrial projects. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm curious as to how that has been magnified with COVID because, you know, not only, you know, in the last, I don't know, five, 10, you know, 20 years, we've seen this declining uh, retail environment to more, you know, digital. But I, I would be really curious in, you know, in your expertise and your opinion, how has that been magnified with COVID, especially now that, you know, we're doing, well, yeah. you know, 60, 70, 90, some of us, 100% of our shopping is all done online now. And how does that yeah. How does that translate over to what, what you're seeing? Yeah, very insightful, and, and that's um, spot on with what um, we've noticed. And I, I, again, no matter what walk of life you're in, you got to have your ears kind of open and you got to be receptive to what's going on and what's changing. And um, this stuff has kind of fallen in our lap too, but exactly what you're alluding to has happened just unfolded right before my eyes in the last couple of years. And so you've got this whole sequence where we're, we're shifting away from kind of retail type of sales. And you're getting a lot of these really big um, companies, um, Bed Bath & Beyond comes to mind, and clothing manufacturers, that what they're finding to be more viable and more profitable is that due to the internet sales, is that they get these, I call them big block warehouses. And they're prominent in Phoenix, and they're really prominent here in Vegas, where we're dealing with a consortium of industrial builders that are putting massive buildings up. I'm talking a million square feet underneath one roof. You know, it's just insane to look at. I mean, you're talking about a monolithic slab that covers 21 acres. Of land, you know, just <laughs> enormous, and it's got 48 foot clear on the inside of it. But it's all being driven by their ability to sell product online, ship it into a warehouse and then redistribute it right out of the warehouse through Amazon and other means. But what you're finding or what we're seeing is a huge um, decline in, in the typical kind of strip center, if you will, commercial type of build out, and just a complete paradigm shift over to these, um, these big block industrial buildings. And then like you alluded to is that you interject in March, February to March, this COVID crisis where everybody is being, you know, staying at home and, and it's feeding more of that online type of shopping. And it's just um, really increased it. It's just unbelievable. It's gone exponential here in the Valley. And again, I, I just, for whatever reason, we've been got right in the middle of that. And um, we ended up with um, probably 40 to 50% of our work now is just on the big block industrial. And it is, um, it's fabulous. It really is. Um, a couple of other notes on that too. And boy, I'm really dating myself here. <laughs> this might have changed, but I remember in seventh grade, Nevada history class, um, Nevada is the free warehousing state. And so these um, folks can actually store their product. And I believe it's still like that. Whereas in California, even I believe Utah and all the surrounding states, you're going to get taxed on that. So Nevada then has got a leg up on people. And you combine that with some of the taxation that's happening in the um, Southern Cal area. And you just got um, a bunch of businesses, not only establishing a presence in Vegas, but coming out of other states to um, establish a presence in, in Nevada. And a couple of other um, items concerning that industrial is that you need to be on a primary corridor. And so Interstate 15 and Interstate 95 both run through Nevada. Unfortunately, they really don't go east-west, but they go north-south and they tie into the 70s and the 80s so they can distribute their product relatively easily. And uh, that's another item of note is that the Reno area has got, um, it's exploding with that big block as well. And they've got Interstate 80, which is a true east-west corridor coming right out of um, Northern California. And that just um, allows them to go due east with, um, with products. So amazing. Um, I just feel um, I'm excited to be a part of it. I love being a part of it. And um, it's uh, been fantastic, so. 
Yeah, a couple of quick points I want to make. I mean, <clears throat> you you hit on you hit the nail on the head with the industrial space. I mean, we've we've seen it quite a bit, and it, it's funny. I I go to church with a guy who's a commercial real estate broker, uh -huh. and I just kind of mentioned in passing. I said, you know, I I don't know what things have been like for you. You know, I think about people in commercial real estate and everything that's going on with COVID, and and I kind of wonder. And he said best year that I've had of, of my entire career because we focus on industrial. And, and so for that reason, because he's not, you know, he says, look, the class A office space, the real high end office space, downtown Phoenix, it's getting crushed. Right. But the industrial space is, is doing super, super well. I personally have three or four deliveries at my house a day, right. Mm -hmm. That come from this. And so, you know, there's, there's the industrial warehouse, which you're spot on about, but then, it's really the whole supply chain. Right? Yeah. I think back to Warren Buffett, people thought he was crazy a decade ago buying into railroads. Mm -hmm. why, why do you need railroads? Well, now all of a sudden we've got all of this product moving throughout the country, a lot of it on railroads, then it goes to the warehouse, then it gets on a, on a semi truck going a certain area, and then it's in another warehouse and being delivered with what they call last mile delivery. Yeah. Right? And so you've got these small, you know, the Amazon trucks that you see everywhere, those are the last mile delivery. It's being delivered within a very small area. Mm -hmm. And so it's going from warehouse to warehouse to warehouse to train to, you know, to truck. I mean, this, this whole supply chain that's been set up and, and put together over the last decade is tremendous. Yes. And it really did almost prepare us for this COVID-19 crisis and has <laughs> allowed business to continue. Yeah. And, you know, you just um, hit on something that we got involved with our first Amazon distribution center here in Vegas. As a matter of fact, it just opened. It's out in North Las Vegas off of uh, Craig Road and Alexander. But um, that whole sequence just blew my mind. My goodness, how they um, they evidently own their own aircraft now and they fly it into McCarran and then they offload that into 18 wheelers, which they own, which go to the, the warehouse between two in the morning and six in the morning, then you got these, um, all these vans that are lined up and you got different sequences of vans that load up quickly in a half hour span and then hit the streets. And then they start, you know, coming back in after about 10 hours, but, and then they distribute the product inside of the warehouse with conveyor belts. And um, <laughs> it's just, it's something else. Amazing. You are right now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I've got a member of my Vistage group that uh, that owns one of these last mile delivery companies. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but he went somewhere from, you know, getting approval with Amazon to be one of their last mile companies and starting with somewhere around 15 trucks. And in 18 months, he's now above 70 trucks just with Amazon. Wow. And it, it's just been, it's exploded his his business growth and he's one of those you know that's that's been blessed through this covid situation and i i make jokes all the time i i wish i were in the plexiglass business right because i would have made a killing over the last 12 months <laughs> you know but uh yeah no it, it's it's one of those things and it's really one of the main reasons that we have this this program is to highlight the fact that small businesses are so good. Now Amazon's a large organization, but Amazon has built itself on the back of other small businesses, mm -hmm. right? And so it's we've got these true tycoons of small business who have figured out a way to make money no matter what happens in the economy, pandemic, whatever it is, you, you figure out a way to just get things done. And, you know, the, the word pivot gets used way too much, but you just figure out a way to pivot or do something a little bit differently because of the hand that you were dealt. Yeah, very well stated there too. You know, one side note that I heard about Amazon, and this is just another mind blowing fact, if it in fact is true, which I would assume it was, I heard it from somebody from Amazon, but in their New York City, like the Manhattan region now, they now guarantee deliveries within like about three hours or something like that. It's like less than a day. Can you imagine that? I could order a, you know, a dozen Pro V1 golf balls and two hours later, it's going to show up on my desk. It's like, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, they, they have some same day delivery stuff in Phoenix as well. It's, it's incredible. It really is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, now, now when you, you go online to order something, you know, if they give you a, a delivery date of more than a few days or, you know, a week or two out, you know, you're looking and going, I don't think so. I thought I'll just, I'll just go to Amazon and find a comparable 
product and have it within 48 hours. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. So a little um, side note about that is that I've got a, a basset hound in the house and um, boy, when that doorbell rings, which seems to happen like three or four times a day now, boy, does he let the whole neighborhood know about the <laughs> delivery man at the door. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I had a basset hound growing up uh, after uh -huh. my parents got divorced. I was uh, 12 and uh, I don't even remember how it happened, but my dad stumbled upon this basset hound and uh you have never heard a dog howl until you have heard of a yes. basset hound. Yes. <laughs> and that um when i first bought the house um before my wife we were actually up in north dakota and a little bit of a long story but i came back down in 2017 and then it was about a year before she came down and i just classic um you know bachelor stuff i i had a television i had a bed I was good, <laughs> but then I brought the basset hound in and you talk about echoing off of those big vaulted ceilings, goodness gracious. <laughs> so there's some truth to hanging pictures and getting carpets down. It actually buffers that sound a bit. <laughs> oh man, I'll tell you. Well, I think this is a good time to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor and then we'll come back. I wanna, I wanna talk to you about, uh, you know, one of the things that I was surprised that you didn't mention in difficulties during COVID was government offices not being open or not being fully staffed and how you've been able to kind of work through that. So oh, I'll, yeah, I'll touch on that. So we'll talk about that. Okay. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better gbsbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. We're here with Ed Tanny of Tanny Engineering, and we've had a great conversation so far. We've talked about uh, COVID, obviously. We've talked about the things that we have to do as small business owners to kind of to do things differently during this time, this time period, but also talked about what the last 20 years has looked like in Southern Nevada from an engineering standpoint and kind of what brings us to where we are today with Ed. And so, you know, Ed and talking about the COVID-19 crisis and, and, you know, the fact that you guys have actually grown through this and continue to have projects to work on. One of the things that came to mind for me was just the fact that, you know, government offices have not fully been open, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've got to have contact with them to get approvals and permits and all those sorts of things. So, what have you guys done as an organization to be able to uh, to work through that and, and maybe a little bit about the relationship that you have with the government offices and how you guys handle things a little differently than maybe some other engineering consulting firms do? Yeah, it's a very, very valid question and very valid, very valid point. And that there's um, there's several, several aspects to that, but one of them, which um, Again, I did not expect this at all. It's very quite contrary to what I had in my mind's eye when I first got this notification. Clark County and the city of North Las Vegas, the city of Henderson and the city of Las Vegas are the, the four primary entities that um, we deal with here. And simultaneously, all four of them um, begin to, to shut down. Now they, they shut down to a certain extent for probably uh, two weeks to a month or so where they went to half, um, half days but eventually, probably starting in April, they ended up coming back to where they were just working remotely. Now, what I thought um, in my mind is that this was really gonna stagnate our ability to process plans. I thought it was gonna be um, much worse than, than it had been. And another point to that effect is that I think any um, entity that, that grows rapidly, much like you guys have had down in Phoenix and here in Vegas, is that ultimately you just end up with more, um, I'm gonna just call it what it is, it's bureaucratic red tape. There's just more departments to have to go through and the longevity or the processing time just keeps on being expanded on grading, getting grading permits and your horizontal, horizontal and vertical construction permits. But what I had envisioned in my mind was quite opposite. <laughs> when the city of North Las Vegas, for instance, went remote, what that enabled me to do all of a sudden is get meetings with all the stakeholders. If I had problems with the planning or with the traffic issue, I could get um, the gentleman from North Las Vegas almost onto a go-to meeting call immediately and discuss the matter. And it turned out completely upside down and we started actually being able to process plans a little bit quicker. 
Now, what drug that down, though, um, kind of in the reverse in the reverse manner, is the fact that we have to submit. Um, in a lot of these entities, we haven't gone completely paperless, um, but we have to actually have bond copies that go out, and then mylar is ultimately, and those were quarantined sometimes for up to a week. So that on the back end of it kind of slowed it down. But I think all in all, from um, from my perspective, and this is just in the private sector of land development, it's actually been um, it's been ref refreshingly um, easier, which is uh, contradictory to what most people would think. So, yeah. Well, I would I would have to say hats off to Clark County and the city of Las Vegas and Henderson that that they you know figured out a way and. And maybe this ultimately ends up changing the way they do things going forward and realize that it doesn't have to be done the way that we've always done it. And then yeah. it actually be more efficient this way. You know, it could very well, but also that, that leads me back to the fact that there's a huge difference in, um, you know, in a, in a governing entity and they're, they're responsible for the, the well-being of the general public, obviously. And so they've got a, a set of guidelines and your typical person that would be um, reviewing a plan set, they're going to just go down a checklist and, that environment that I just painted is perfect for that. If they're at their at their home, they actually have the ability to sit down without the phone ringing, without people coming in to disturb them. It's conducive to them getting that that task done quicker, and that's really what's unfolded. Yeah. But on the flip side, though, when you're a consulting firm, it's just vitally important that we um, we talk amongst each other, and that's a face to face deal, and that um, that has been a very very much a hardship. So. You know, from my perspective, um, I am just grateful when we have staff that um, actually will come in. And, you know, when we go into a conference room and meet on a project, we do the social distancing, uh, wear masks, and, um, but we can still communicate and we can still look eye to eye. We can, um, you know, try to, try to ferret out a lot of the complications that can happen in my, in my realm of the world. So pros and cons to everything, but um, one, one heck of a challenge. And I'll tell you that it's been one heck of a challenge. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, hats off to you and your staff as, as well as, like I said, those governmental entities to, to figure out a way to still get business done. Because, you know, I think that the impression is, and, I'm, and then I'm going to let Landon talk to you about how you've, how you've grown over the last 20 years, because I think it's been impressive. But um, I, I think that there's this impression throughout the country that Las Vegas is just where you go to go gambling, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, people are always surprised when Landon says, you know, I live 20 minutes from the strip like i'm i'm very rarely in that area of town and you know las vegas really over the last 20 to 30 years has has really become just like any other city yes the gambling's there the strips there people come into town for the conventions and, and you guys are very reliant on that uh revenue right for for the tax base and that sort of thing but you can find any kind of industry in, in Las Vegas. And, and I think that uh, it's done a tremendous job of becoming more of a destination for business beyond just that's where we're going to have a convention because we want our people to come in and have fun for a few days and, and learn about something. Well, thank you, Austin. That is a great topic that you just brought up. Great topic in that, um, yeah, Las Vegas has a perception, and um, this perception is never going to, it's never going to change with the majority of America or the world, for that matter. And for instance, whenever you're flying into Vegas on an airplane, people are just ready to go. And that, that is the perception, and that's what Vegas is all about. That's why we don't pay state income tax, yeah. is that you've got this um, gaming element that um, happens down on the Strip and on the primary corridor, and People are there to have fun and what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? <laughs> but on the flip side of that, and I've had this discussion with a multitude of, um, you know, not only friends of mine from different parts of America, but also with family members is that Las Vegas is wonderful. It is a wonderful place to raise a family. It's a wonderful place to be very active in church, which I am. And we reach out, you know, heavily through Tandy Engineering with that aspect too. And there are wonderful people around here. And it's also um, a wonderful place to be involved with Little League athletics or anything else, any other type of typical venture that you're going to have in America. And you integrate that in Vegas, where you also have the ability to run down and get a gallon of milk at 2.30 in the morning. It's a pretty good place, you know, so I love it. I really do. And I think um, it's unfortunate that there is that perception, but um, 
Um, that perception is not necessarily reality. <laughs> when, like Landon and I can attest to, it's like I go down to the strip twice a year when my in-laws make me take them to the strip. So, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's pretty normal for for residents of Las Vegas. Yes, Henderson. Right. But, yeah, but a very vibrant place, and um, yeah, it's um, yeah, yeah, unlike um, well, there's a couple of inherent problems with Phoenix and Vegas when you stick millions of people in the middle of a desert, water becomes king, doesn't it? So. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Those frozen margaritas uh, only go so far, right, on, on the Las Vegas Strip. But other than that, you really need water. You do. And it's like, a, it's from my engineering perspective, I have no problem with this because it's um, it's what makes us have the ability to not pay seed income tax. But they rightfully put moratoriums on landscaping, you know, back in the... Um, in the 50s and the 60s and through the 70s, people would be planting grass in the front yards and that happened down in Phoenix as well. And then they finally figured out that the water's running out. So they eventually put moratoriums on that. And then eventually they go to a, a, a perspective where new homes will only have a very small amount of grass, if any, available in the rear yard. But yet our nice casinos that come in, they can spray that stuff all over the place and have fountains and it's uh, <laughs> that's perfectly acceptable and I get it, so yeah. Yeah, no, I hear you. I, I actually live in a neighborhood. Actually, I was thinking Landon had been to my house, but he hasn't. Um, I, I live in a neighborhood that happens to have groundwater. And so we have an exemption for that. Oh. So my neighborhood has trees and grass everywhere, which means okay. that it's never hard to sell a house in that neighborhood because people want this, you know, oasis in the desert type of a, of a deal. And it was one of the things that draw that drew us to that neighborhood as well. But Okay. You're right. Everywhere else, it's it's that desert landscape. More which, yeah. You know, if so I got kind have... of a, a funny side story with that. Um, the house that I owned here out in the northwest part of the valley for uh, probably about like 12 years or so, we were on a, um, you call it a quasi-municipal well, where, you know, before the growth really um, caught a lot of those outlying areas, people would take a two and a half acre parcel and subdivide it into four lots, put a private cul-de-sac on it, and then put four homes up. And you could get a well. And so that's what we had on this property was a, a well that serviced all four lots. Now, ultimately what happened is that, um, you know, the Las Vegas Valley Water District figured out that they could, um, you know, enact a, a moratorium on, on wells. And if you ever ran dry or if they ever got a municipal line within, I think, 500 feet of your property, then they put a moratorium in place that made you cap the well and then tap into their into their water line. Now that's a it's a pretty big cost, you know. So, for those four lots, when this was going on, probably about twelve years ago or so, I think we were looking at oh, well over a hundred thousand dollars to to do that. You know, there was a water main that got brought in. We were going to have to bring it down like eight hundred feet, and then we had to have the the water meters. And what they do is that they assess the impact fees on the water meters, which pays for future infrastructure. So anyway, you, you add it all up and all. All four of us were looking at like $30,000 bills or something like that to do this. And, and my wife was just kind of joking around with me and she goes, well, it's, um, how, how does that work? How come the well owners don't have enough power to overcome this? You know, and I said, no, hun, you know, in school, they, they taught us that water flows downhill. Well, in all actuality, it flows towards money <laughs> <laughs> and the water district has the money. So um, that's the way that that worked out, but all for the right reasons in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, Landon, Ed, I want to about growth. Let's. Yeah, yeah, bef yeah, absolutely. Before we get in that, Ed, I want to just circle back um, to a comment that you made, and uh, I want to just hear your thoughts. Uh, you you've talked a little bit about um, the 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 personal connection with your staff, with your clients, with these government entities that you deal with. And obviously, you know, um, the environment, uh, you know, we've seen a huge shift to digital, to this heavy reliance on social media when it comes to communicating. And you kind of alluded to maybe that doesn't translate so well over to growing a healthy consulting firm. So talk to us a little bit about why that is and what you've done to keep morale high when you maybe can't have a lot of, you know, physical, uh, you know, interactions with, with other people that you deal with. Yeah. Another great subject, Landon, really, really good subject. And that, um, 
this is a wonderful topic for me personally because of the different challenges that we have gone through. And it's um, really me and my partners here. We've had um, well, quite a few different things that have transpired since we opened up shop. I ended up getting into a really horrendous lawsuit with some ex-business partners. I was part of a different company back in the 1990s and I ended up parting ways. And a uh, long story, not even worth repeating, but we ended up throwing rocks at each other, made some attorneys pretty wealthy through the whole thing. But that happened when we first started the um, Canny Engineering. And then we went through that horrendous um, crash in 2008, which um, Austin already mentioned. And um, that was very, very challenging as well. We've also had just um, kind of odds and ends that have happened with, uh, with employees around, around the office. But one thing that is um, really where I have grown, I and mean, I've just grown tremendously, is that um, a lot of issues that crop up in life, um, you really kind of cause on your own. And with me, on kind of on a personal note, it's just the volatility of this business. And I've alluded to the fact that, um, you know, we, we work with clientele that have huge interest carry notes that are going on and it can get very, very volatile. And um, because of the, the way that I've just been, the cloth that I was cut from or whatever you'd want to say is that I, I had a tendency to get pretty darn angry on occasions. I would get angry with clients. Um, I would get angry with staff. And how counterproductive is that when you really are able to, to sit back and monitor what you're doing, how you're being a cause in the action of what may be transpiring around you. And one thing that um, I've really grown at recently is um, starting with the staff level is making sure that um, you know, the project engineers that we're bringing along, and I'm talking about the project engineers and even the, um, the up and coming um, engineers that are just in their first couple of years, is just this, um, this ability to really um, communicate well and to com communicate well, but also um, you know, stop when you're, when you're starting to get a little bit on the angry side, which can happen in this business. And it just flows from the top to the bottom. You know, when, if I get yelled at by a client, then my tendency is going to be going out and kind of taking it out on the guy that may have made a perceived mistake or whatever. But we've, um, we've been able to solidify a staff and it's primarily through that. And even when I, um, when I make a mistake, and I, Lord knows I do, and I continue, well, I will make more of them as a, on a move forward basis, but I actually have Apology Fridays <laughs> where I really kind of look back every month or so and I say, oh my goodness, you know, I probably shouldn't have acted like that with this employee and I won't get into specifics, but I'll just take a little bit of time to bring them in and authentically, authentically from the bottom of my heart, acknowledge them for everything that they're doing that's correct. And I found that there's a whole paradigm shift that goes on in an office environment or in your household, whatever, is that when you actually act from that, um, it's amazing what can happen. First of all, you're really um, acknowledging folks, but you're also just being human and you're, and you're acknowledging the fact that you've made a mistake and, um, and it really just kind of repairs a lot and it just really allows just a shift to happen. And, um, I think through that, I've actually had some employees that have done the same. You know, they, it's actually kind of stepped down a little bit when I've seen them reach out and kind of repair some stuff. And it really has led to a cohesive nature around this office, which is, which is unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. And as far as um, getting angry, uh, I've done a couple of things here recently I wanted to mention, which are just um, incredible. And I don't know that the outcome would always be like this, but... There was a client um, that was a big industrial builder, and um, we both are a little bit on the prideful side, I would say, and he would get angry also. And finally, one day, this really blew up. It blew up to a point where, unfortunately, they took their work. They, they took their work out of TNE Engineering, and they took it elsewhere. And, you know, what you're kind of left with that is that I'm, you know, just saying, boy, I, he shouldn't have done that, and I'm sure he was doing the same thing about me, but regardless of all that, it took me about six months on that one, but right before last Christmas, I called the guy. And again, from the bottom of my heart, I just authentically told him I was wrong in what I did. I didn't bring anything that was perceived on his end. I just said, this is what I did and I was wrong. I should have never done that. And I just wanted to say, I really apologize to you. And it just kind of took him back a little bit, but he said, well, thank you very much for doing that. Now, what happened last week is that the guy called me back and he gave us more work. So... I don't know, um, and again, that's not always going to be the, it's not always going to be the end of that story, but regardless of whether or not he would have come back or not, 
just that simple act of letting that go is um, is powerful. So this is my wisdom that's coming at the age of 57. And by the way, I've got so many more of those to clean up. <laughs> <laughs> Bring me back in a year and I'll tell you some more because there's a, I think we all collect a list of those as we, as we walk through life, but it's, um, and, and that's the part that just really gets me up in the morning too. And it makes me feel good about, um, about the staff that we have and really the environment that we have. And it's, um, it's incredible. So. Well, I, I expect a phone call sometime in the very near future, <laughs> apologizing for your downplaying your golfing abilities <laughs> as we always go out and golf because you, you tend to mop the floor with me every time we play. So <laughs> no, I'll give you an update on that. I might be playing with some prominent people here Thursday. So we'll see how that uh, goes. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> well, um, Ed, we, you know, as we start to kind of push up against time here, um, we want to, we want to hear, you know, what, what's on the horizon, you know, for you and for this great company and this great culture that you built over at your firm, talk to us about, you know, what, what's coming up in the next, you know, a uh, couple years, um, where do you see your company going? And then also, um, you know, a lot of the work that Austin and I do is around succession and exit and transition planning. And maybe talk to us about the, the big picture for, you know, you, what, what ultimately, what, what do you see happening with your, with your firm when you're getting to a point where you're, you know, yeah. not uh, going to be working anymore? Great question. Great question. So from a personal uh, point of view, I kind of shared that I'm um, an empty nester. You know, we've got kids that are going to be graduating very, very soon, hopefully. <laughs> and then um, moving on with their lives. And so my wife and I are, um, we, we occupy our time in different manners. She's very active in church. I am as well. We do a lot of um, outreach type of programs, but I really love what I do. And I think I'm, I'm realizing that I love what I do, not necessarily because it's the engineering, which I thrive on, which I truly do, but it's more about um, it's more about the type of environment that we're providing. It's really more about the outreach programs that we have here in the Vegas area. So on a personal level, I don't see myself um, getting out of this game for quite some time, whether it be 10 or 20 years, I don't know. I'm 57 now, but I can really honestly see myself continuing on until the age of 80. If Lord willing, I got a healthy body and a, and a clear mind at that point of time. Um, as far as my partners go though, I don't know what the future is gonna hold hold with them. Um, we just kind of play that by ear. We talk a lot and we'll just, um, you know, everybody's got their own, their own path in life and you got to be very respectful of that. And I don't know um, exactly what they, what they will be doing on a move forward basis, but I'm extremely excited, not about um, necessarily the continued growth of Vegas, which by the way, I see an end coming to that um, because there is just a certain amount of privately held land left in the Valley. I mean, we're about done. We might be able to continue out the corridors going down I-15 in the 95 and maybe jumping over into El Dorado Valley in the Boulder City, but there might be a time frame on that perhaps. Um, but I'm just excited about staying pace with these technological advances with Tani Engineering, um, continuing to grow these employees as people more than anything, and having an input into this, um, into this wonderful area that is known as Las Vegas. And, trying to get that perceived perception to switch a little bit maybe with the, the people out there. But um, that's what I got going. And I, I'm just excited to be alive. I really do. I love life right now. I love the environment that we have. I, I love the, the whole atmosphere of what we got going. And I'm looking forward to playing golf with Landon Mance again. So. <laughs> Well, we've got, we've got to make this happen when I'm in town as well. So, well, come on out. Yeah. My rule, Austin, is at least give me 20 minutes to get to the tee box. Okay. That's my only rule. <laughs> okay. As long as I give you 20 minutes advance notice, huh? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that, you know, one of the things that stuck, that sticks out for me, and we all have weaknesses, we all do things wrong as, as business leaders, and we have to course correct from time to time, right? Um, but you know, what I hear today from you, Ed is, you know, a, a lot of times in the media, business owners get this bad rap as we're just greedy people who are trying to make money on the backs of other people. Right. Yeah. And, and that, I think that's an unfortunate narrative that that's out there. And 
you have shown us that that's not you, right? I mean, we're all running businesses. We're all trying to, to be profitable as, you know, as a business, but you are obviously recognize that the most important asset that you have as a business owner walks out the door every day at five or six or whenever it is that they walk that's out right. the door, right? Mm -hmm. And it's those people and you care about them individually, you care about their progression as professionals, but you care more even about them as individuals yeah. and what they do out in the community. And you're modeling that for them with the commitments that you guys have at Tanny Engineering and the outreach yeah. that you guys do. And so, you know, I, I would say hats off to you. I mean, it, it's obviously great to be recognized for the growth of the of the business, which you've done a tremendous job of over the last 20 years. But giving people an opportunity to have employment and to grow professionally and personally is, is a big, big deal. And well, thank you. you for and how about this concept? I'm just going to throw this out there. Not that it would be me, but wouldn't it be refreshing to have somebody in public office that goes and quits attacking other people and just goes off of kind of enjoying other people's presence and um, shifting that paradigm. Now I'm really dreaming, but I had to throw that out there. <laughs> Are you trying to hint at a uh, future uh, endeavor? No, I, I don't think so. I think I'll still be continuing to be on the golf course with you, Landon, and be here in my office. I really have no aspirations to jump into that, but it would be refreshing. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because I was in the car yesterday thinking to myself, you know, I got to bar start buying up websites in case I end up going towards political office at some point because I, I just get tired of the spin, to be honest. Oh, goodness, yeah. Right? And so I'm thinking to myself, I got to buy this website, No Spin Austin, or, you know, something like that because it's just, I get so tired of the sound bites. I would much rather have somebody stand up there and say, this is what's going on. The, the left wants to tell you this, the right wants to tell you this, here's the reality. Yeah. And let's work together and find solutions together for the problems that we face as an Amer as, as a, as a country, right? Yeah. We live in the best country in the world. I don't, I don't, I have a hard time any with anybody disputing that we have more opportunity than any country in the world. And we don't need to turn into this argument back and forth all the time about the best way to get where we're going. Everybody ultimately, I hope, is trying to go this, the same direction. It's yeah. just we disagree on, on how to get there, but we can do that civilly. Yeah. And my response to that is amen to that, brother. Amen yeah. to that. Well, I, I have really appreciated the conversation. We want to make sure you have an opportunity to throw the website out there, phone number, whatever it is, best way to get a hold of you. Uh, we obviously have some real estate developers who listen to the program, and we want you to be able to use this any way that you can to help grow your business as well. So Yeah, well, thank you very much, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, it's www.tannycorp.com is our website and our uh, primary phone number here in Las Vegas is area code 702-362-8844. And uh, I just love the ability to just really make relationships more than anything. We're, we're certainly here to be a, um, a presence to any sort of land developers or builders. And um, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks for being on the show. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Ed. Okay, Lynn, take care. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.